So this screencast will be about the Fisher's exact test, which is designed to test a hypothesis about proportions. So let's say we're interested in determining whether there's an association between two binary variables, then we can use the Fisher's exact test to, to test that and generate a p-value. Another way of saying that is maybe we want to, we're interested in determining whether a proportion is the same in two groups. So that's just another way of describing the same question, whether a proportion is the same in two groups or an association between two binary variables. For instance, let's say we have, we're interested in determining whether smoking is associated with drinking alcohol. And we have a number of individuals in our sample and we can we assign either a zero or a one to each individual based on whether or not they smoke. So we, uh, maybe we ask them a survey question, do you, do you smoke cigarettes? And if they say yes, we give them a one. And if they say no, we give them a zero. And then, so that's one binary variable. And we might have a second binary variable that corresponds to drinking alcohol. So similarly, we might ask them, do you drink alcohol? And if they say yes, we give them a one. And if they say no, we give them a zero. So now we have two binary variables. And we can ask the question, is smoking associated with drinking alcohol? Or another way of stating that, as I described before, is whether the proportion differs between two groups. So the, does the proportion of individuals that smoke differ between um, when we compare those that drink with those that do not drink. So the proportion of smokers among those that drink and the proportion of smokers among those that do not drink. Are those two proportions equal or different? So these are two, just two ways of describing the same question and both of, um, and so that question, both both ways of stating that question can be addressed with the Fisher's exact test and also with the Pearson's chi-square test. But in this screencast, I'll, I'll just discuss the Fisher's exact test. Um, it's very well used. It's a very popular test currently, and it's very accurate at generating at the um, at the, the estimation of the p-value is um, is very accurate so that's that's an attraction of using this method but it's computationally intensive if there are large numbers of individuals in the sample and that's historically why the Pearson's chi-square test has been been used um, widely so but the Fisher's exact test depends on understanding. If you want to understand how it works or have some level of understanding of how the, how the Fisher's exact test functions, you need to understand this expression here, n choose k. So n above k in the, in the um, parentheses. And n choose k is is a combinatorial, a useful combinatorial expression that describes the way, how many ways you can choose k objects from n total objects where we don't care about the order of those k objects. So in other words, if n were, um, if n is a sample of all the letters in the, I mean, n includes all the letters in the alphabet, and k is a sample of those letters, let's say we choose a random sample and it happens to be a, b, and c, then the sample 
A, if K is A, B, and C, that's the same as C, B, A, or A, C, B. It's, we don't distinguish between the different ordering. And that's what N choose K allows us to do, is estimate that. So, in general, when we work with probability, um, Fisher's exact test is all based on the hypergeometric distribution, probability distribution, which is a discrete distribution, and um, and it's the hypergeometric distribution is based on um, it. It heavily is uses this expression, the binomial coefficient. So it's essential to understand what the binomial coefficient is in order to understand the hypergeometric distribution and Fisher's exact test. In general, in probability, understanding, being able to calculate combinations and counting numbers of things, just counting up things, is very important because probability is essentially all about counting up things. So, and one way to think about the definition of probability is if we conduct an experiment many, many, many times, approaching an, an infinite number of times, and um, we count up of all those, the number of times we conducted the experiment, how many times did our event of interest occur? So let's say where we want to find out the probability of an event. So we count up the number of times our event occurred and we divide it by the total number of times we conducted the experiment. And if we, if we did that an infinite number of times or a number approaching an infinity, then that really defines the probability of our event. So that's one way of thinking of the definition of probability. So it depends on us being able to count up things. We have to count up uh, equally likely um, equally likely events or and count up the total possible outcome. So equally likely outcomes and total possible outcomes, then we can create this proportion and calculate the probability. So that's essentially how the hypergeometric distribution is formed and it's composed of this binomial coefficient. And as you can see the binomial coefficient is made up of these terms that have that are all uh, factorial. So n factorial divided by k factorial times n minus k factorial. So just as a refresher, factorial means n, or n factorial means n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, etc. And the way to think about this expression is, um, one way is to first break it up into its parts and understand n factorial by itself. So n factorial is an expression that it, it describes the number of permutations, number of ways that we can permute n items. So if we change the order, how many different orderings of n can we get? So that is equal to n factorial. We can compute it. And um, it's the same, another way of thinking of that is how many ways can we sample n objects from n. Those are just different ways of expressing the same, same idea. And one way of thinking of that is let's say, let's say we're going to sample. Either we're going we're gonna to take a sample of n items or we're going to create a, um, a permutation, a random or, or an ordering and we want to know how many different orderings or how many ways can we sample. So we, at first we sample the one item, the first item. How many ways can we sample one item from n items? Well, there are n ways, right? There are n possible items that we can choose for that first item. 
either in our sample or in the first position of our ordering. What about the second item? Well, there are now only n minus 1 items left because we already took one out. So there are n minus 1 ways we can choose a second item. So, so far we have n times n minus 1 ways to choose the first items. And this is, the reason we multiply is the multiplication, the property of multiplication in combinatorial, combinatorics. And that idea, the reason why we multiply like that is that the basic idea is that if we have n way, if we have, let's say, a ways that we can do, do something, and we have b ways we can do a second thing, then, and we ask the question, well, how many ways can we do both things? If these ways are, if, if it doesn't, if we can do any combination of A and any, with any, any one of A with any one of B, if they're all allowed, then there are a total of A times B ways that we can do both A and B. So that, this is the property, um, the multiplication property of combinatorics. And so here we just multiply n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, and we get n factorial total ways that we can sample n items from n items where we care about the ordering. So here are the, the total number of ways, but um, we divide by k factorial and n minus times n minus k factorial because those are the various combinations and we don't we don't care about the as I mentioned before we don't care about the um, how k is ordered k has no meaningful order so we essentially adjust for that by dividing so that's the this um, expression n choose k and now I want to jump to the expression for the hypergeometric distribution. So the hypergeometric distribution can be described as the probability. Well, let's say um, let's say we have a set of n n total items. And among that, those n items, we have, um, we can think of a sample of small n. So we have a sample of small n from the large n items. And also in the large n items, we have a, a sample or a set of small n items. Either You can think of it either way. And then also among the large n items, we have k large k successes. But among our sample of little n, we have small k successes. So the hypergeometric distribution describes the probability of little k successes in little n draws from a population of size big N with big k total successes in the population. And here, when I say population, I just mean large n. It doesn't necessarily mean the whole population that we're interested in. Um, so don't get confused by that notation. Now, we have, if we look at the expression here, we have three, it's composed of these three binomial coefficients here, k, choose little k, and the remaining n minus k, choose little n minus little k, divided by the total n, choose little n. And so this gives us the probability that in our small sample of n, we have little k successes. So Fisher took this idea, and this is, so this, we have to specify 
to actually compute the probability, we have to know what big N is, we have to know what um, big K is, and we have to know what little n is. So if we go to a, a contingency table, um, a, we think of this in the context of a contingency table, which is what Fisher did. He said, hey, this idea, this idea of a probability in hypergeometric um, distribution, um, we can apply that to a two by two table to determine whether there's evidence of a correspondence between group A and outcome B, or these two different factors. So here you can see um, that if we go back, we have little k, we have a in the table represents our little a, and then our k and our large k and minus k and large n are all represented. Um, they're all represented by marginal values on the table. So we have a plus b here, c plus d. We have n down here. So those are our marginal values. And then also a plus c down here is our, our marginal values. So this actually, the small n here is, um, corresponds to the large n here on the hypergeometric distribution. So essentially, we're saying given that we have these sums on the margin of the table, what is the probability that we observed what's inside the table, and, and specifically this, the A, the A here, and um, the A and the C. So, um, but that, um, but it, it, it's the same as just knowing that, um, it's the same as the, just the probability in general of getting these specific cells given that we have these margins. So what Fisher suggested is we can calculate the probability of what we observed, of the actual numbers we observed, and add that to the probabilities of everything that's as extreme or more extreme than what we observed, and that is the the definition of a p-value. So that's essentially like a two-tailed p-value, a two-tailed test, and that's how the Fisher tests work. So it can be comp computationally um, intensive, so you wouldn't be expected to actually calculate this out by hand, but there are a lot of software packages that do it, and it's important to understand the basics of what the test is useful for and why it works and that one of the nice things about this test is it's accurate even with very small cell, uh, small counts in the cells. And so thanks, that's where I'll stop with for now.